Yeah. Right, as Marcus said, I'm a volunteer with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And I'll tell you a little bit about the trust to start with. So the trust was set up by Professor Dave Dawson a number of years ago because he was concerned about the very large reductions in numbers and distribution of bumblebees, what's been described as the plight of the bumblebee. So the trust has been set up to try and reverse that. So trust people are doing quite a lot of research to understand bumblebee conservation and ecology because to be able to improve things for bumblebees, we need to understand exactly what they need in the terms of habitat. So the trust is working with various landowners to try and increase bumblebee habitat. And this is something which we can all do within our gardens. And so the mission is to increase the numbers and the distribution of bumblebees. This just gives some indication of the range of projects which the trust is involved in at the moment. The Bee Walk is a citizen science project and quite a lot of members of the trust are regularly walking transects once a month recording all the bumblebees that they see. And so there's now a very large database going on that which is able to give us an idea of how bumblebee numbers are changing from year to year. Quite a few of the conservation projects are based in areas where some of our various species are on the brink of their distribution. They're hanging on by their toes to the edges of the coast, like some of the short-haired bumble short bumblebees being reintroduced down in Dungeness in Kent. The great yellow bumblebee is hanging on on the northwest of Scotland, and the shrill carder bee, one of its areas, is in South Wales. So the trust is trying to improve the habitat for the bumblebees in those key areas. And they're finding that while they do this, a lot of the other bumblebees are also increasing in their distribution and their numbers. So trust volunteers are involved, some of them with some of those projects. So I say quite a few involved with Bee Walk, others do fundraising. Some like me are trying to pass on what we're learning about bumblebees. So I'm delighted that so many of you are interested in learning about bumblebees. And I'll just try and give you just a bit of an introduction today to help you learn a bit more and give you some resources, which if you're keen, you can used to learn further and this little group here in the corner of the screen these are involved in the pollinating the peak project and they're going into schools they've got a big education project there telling children about bumblebees and it's wonderful how keen a lot of the children are and the work that they're doing themselves now within schools so to come and talk about bumblebees in the garden I want to think about I'm trying to help you decide which bees are bumblebees. If there are other insects that look a bit like bumblebees, how to tell the difference between them and the actual bumblebees. And then we'll look at some of the characteristics of the common bumblebees. And tell you a little bit about the life cycle behavior of the bees. And then talk about the loss of their natural habitat and what gardeners can do to help this. And then as I said, we've got a series of links and resources for those who'd like to learn more. So when people hear about the plight of bees and all the problems that bees are having, a lot of people think only of the honeybee and don't realise just how many different bees we've got in the UK. So there's just one species of domesticated honeybee. There are far more bees than just the honeybee, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware. There are actually more than 240 species of solitary bees in the UK and these range in size from some of almost the size of bumblebees to others that are scarcely bigger than an ant. There's a huge range there and I can't claim to be able to identify more than a few species of solitary bees. So the bumblebees themselves we've got either 24 or 26 species in the UK depending on how you count them. There's one which could be counted as one species or a group, an aggregate of three species. So it's either 24 or 26, but out of these, six to eight are common depending upon your locality. But generally the bumblebees are big, furry and colorful, like the one we've got sitting here. 
Now, the description, big, furry and colourful, can also apply to some other insects. And we'll just have a look at one or two of these to see how they differ from bumblebees. So some of the solitary bees are also quite big and furry. And this is the hairy-footed flower bee. This is the male. The male is brown. And it's got the name from, if you can see down on his lower leg and foot here, he's got a lot of very long hairs on his foot. The hairy-footed flower bees tend to be one of the earliest bees out in spring. And although they could be the size of a small bumblebee, they've got quite a different flight pattern. They dart about a lot more than the bumblebee does. And you may see the males chasing the females. The females are black. They are actually about the same size as the male. So the females are all black. You sometimes see these bumblebees hovering in front of a flower. Sorry, sometimes see these solitary bees hovering in front of a flower. And as I say, they can look quite like bumblebees, but if you watch the way they're flying, they'll dart about a lot more than the bumblebees will. And you'll sometimes see them sitting basking like this as well, which will give you a better look at them. Some of the other solitary bees are also quite colourful and furry, like the tawny mining bee here. But these are much slimmer than bumblebees. Bumblebees generally look a lot more rounded than this. So these slimline bees are more likely to be solitary bees than bumblebees. Some of the hoverflies can also look like bumblebees. They're bee mimics. So the Volicella bombillions is a bumblebee mimic. So it's evolved to look like a bumblebee. So you can see it's also quite colourful and furry and got some stripes to it as well. To tell the difference between these hoverflies and the bees, first of all, the bees have two pairs of wings, but it's not always very easy to see the two individual wings. If you look at the way these are folded, it looks like just a single wing here. If you look on the other side, you can see that there are simply two wings here, whereas the hoverflies have only one pair of wings. So also the hoverflies have enormous eyes, often covering most of the head, and just these tiny little antennae compared to the smaller eyes and long antennae of a bumblebee. This is another fly which can be mistaken for a bumblebee. It's the large bee fly, again another early spring insect, and you can see it's got lovely furry coats here. So it can look quite similar to a carder bee, which is all brown. But if you get a chance to look at them closely, again they quite like basking in the sun. You see they've got these extremely long legs and a very long proboscis. And again, see just the, the two wings here quite clearly. And these are parasitic on solitary bees, which nest in the ground. And the female will hover outside the nest entrance of the solitary bee and kick her eggs into it. So the larvae will then parasitize the bee's larvae as they're developing. But they are lovely insects. You can sometimes see groups of them dancing in the sunlight in the spring. So coming on to the bumblebees, and to look through the common bumblebees, bees, we've got two here sitting together here on the he bee. So although all these bees are described as being common, you may find, like I do, that you'll see a lot more of some of them than others. So I'll tell you the bees that I see most often here on the Great Horn, but for you it could be quite different. So I'll start off with the bucktailed bumblebee. It's one of the first ones you're likely to see in spring. This is like when people really start noticing bumblebees, when these great big queens are out, and you often see them flying back, quartering the ground, looking for nest sites. Now, as you can tell that she's a female, if you look closely at her legs here, you see this shiny section on the leg. This is the pollen basket. This is where she'd be gathering pollen. With a shiny section on the leg here, which is fringed with hairs. Look at the patterns on the bucktail bumblebee. They've got a sort of an orangey colour stripe at the front of the thorax and one on the abdomen. And then the queen bucktail bumblebees have generally a buff coloured tail. This is a worker 
bucktail bumblebee. And I managed to get photographs of the two of them on the same flower. So you can see the relative size difference. Now the workers can vary quite a lot in size, but they are always smaller than the queen bumblebees. And here you can see the pollen that she's been collecting here, huge lump of pollen stuck on her leg. And bumblebees can actually carry about 70% of their weight around with them, which seems a huge feat to me. So she's got generally the same pattern as the queen with the two orange stripes here. It doesn't show up in this photo, but her tail is white rather than buff, which can make it difficult to distinguish her from the white tail bumblebee, which we'll look at in a minute. And here's the male bucktailed bumblebee. If you compare his leg here, the one we can see on the queen, where she's got a nice shiny section on the leg here, the male bumblebees have hairy legs. So they don't gather pollen, so on this part of the leg here you'll see a lot more hair. It's a slightly different shape, more rounded joint compared with this very sharp joint on the female. And the, the buff-tailed male will have a slight buff-coloured band just before the white on his tail. So that's the buff-tailed bumblebee, one of the most common ones which I see here. The next one is the white-tailed bumblebee, again quite a large queen. And you can see an orangey band here at the front of the thorax and a more yellowy band in this one on the abdomen. Now the, the yellows are not always as clear as this, so they can look quite similar to the bucktails, but the queen white-tailed bumblebee has a very distinct white tail. Now this is the overall name Bombsley Corum for the white-tailed bumblebees, but they're actually a group and aggregate of probably three different species. This one Bombus cryptarum, the cryptic bumblebee, and there's also a northern bumblebee. So this is why I said sometimes you can count them as 24 bumblebees in the UK and sometimes as 26, depending on whether you count the other two white-tailed ones as separate species. This is a white-tailed worker. And this is one of the few photos I've taken outside this area because I see very few of the white-tailed bumblebees here. But she does have quite yellow bands here and a very white tail. So I say it's often very difficult to tell the difference between a worker of the white-tailed bumblebees and the buff-tailed bumblebees. But because I see so few queens or males of the white tail, I generally assume that the workers I'm seeing are buff tails. Here's the male of the buff tailed bumblebees, and he's got a lot of yellow on the front of him. He's got yellow on his face and very yellow front, and he's got pure white tail. Remember I said that the buff tailed males have got a slight band of buff above the tail. The white-tailed males are completely white here. So that's the white-tailed bumblebee, said to be a very common one, but not one that I see here very often. The red-tailed bumblebee is very distinctive. Again, looking at the queen, got a black body and then a bright red section at the end of the tail here. And one of the other ones I've managed to get on the same plant to give size of scale. This is the worker of the red tail. Again, you can see her, her red tail and again, enormous pollen baskets that she's carrying. The, the red tailed workers are generally quite small. The buff tails can vary quite a lot in size. The red tails tend to be mainly sort of fairly small. Now the workers, sorry, the males of the red tailed bumblebees are another colourful bumblebees. Again, he's got his red tail here. He's got a band of yellow at the front of the thorax and also yellow on his face as well. As you can see on his leg here, he's dusted with quite a lot of pollen. So the males will pick up pollen about their bodies, they're moving from flower to flower, but they don't actively gather any pollen. 
This is the early bumblebee. This is our smallest British bumblebee. And although it's described as early, it's not necessarily coming out any earlier than others like the buff-tailed bumblebee. They might be better described as an early nesting bumblebee because they tend to go through their life cycle fairly early in the season. This is a really pretty little bumblebee. So you can see the queen here, she's got a red tail and two yellow stripes. And if you look at her leg here, often the bumblebees seem to have their legs tucked up and you can't see quite how long the legs are. So it's this section here that she has her pollen basket on. Although it often looks as if that's the top of the leg, you can see she's got another couple of joints above it. This is a worker of the early bumblebees and they have the same patterns as the queens, but it, you can see it's hard to see her yellow band across the top of the abdomen. And as bumblebees age, they can start to lose some of their hair and they can also start to fade. So when they're nice and fresh like this one, it's really easy to recognize the colors. But as they get older, it can be harder to identify some of them. They start to lose some of their stripes. Here's the male of the early bumblebees. And again, he's another very yellow, very colorful bumblebee. So he's got more yellow on his front and he's got yellow on his face as well. So again, sort of the yellow stripe and the red tail. So the workers of these can be absolutely tiny. So although we say that bumblebees are big, some of these workers are very small. I had an interesting comment last summer from a neighbour when I was going out hunting bumblebees and she said I didn't think there were any bumblebees about at the moment. That's because if you don't see the queens, the workers are a lot smaller and they're not really as obvious as bumblebees. This is the common card of bumblebee, sometimes described as an all brown bumblebee, which makes it sound rather dull, but they've got some beautiful gold and ginger hairs on them. So here we've got the queen. The worker has got the same pattern again, an all ginger, all brown bumblebee, and you can see her pollen baskets again here. And this is the male, the same patterns again. Now, if you look at his antennae here, you can see compared with the females, the antennae are slightly longer and they're more curved. They've got one more joint in them than the antennae on the females. And you might not always be able to see the legs if you're just watching bumblebees rather than catching them. So it's another characteristic to look out for if you want to decide if it's a male or a female, the longer, more curved antennae. Now, there are two other harder bumblebees which look very similar to the common carders, the moss carder and the brown banded carder, and it's very difficult to distinguish them visually. So it may be that they're unrecorded simply because everyone like me assumes that what you're seeing is a buff-tailed bumblebee. I keep looking at some of these and hoping that I might find one of the others, but I've not been able to definitely identify anything yet as being anything other than a common carder bumblebee. The tree bumblebee is an interesting one. These first arrived in the southeast of the UK in 2001. They made their own way across from the continent and have been gradually spreading northwards and westwards across Britain. And they're now moving into Scotland and moving up through Scotland. They don't seem to be competing with our existing bumblebees. And it may be that they're able to spread because they're utilizing different nest sites to our other bumblebees. And I'll talk more about nest sites in a minute. But these, this is another bumblebee, which like the common carder bumblebee has all three of the bumblebees looking the same. So this is the queen, it's got very distinctive coloring with a brown thorax, black abdomen and a white tail. And again, you can see the same pattern here on the worker. And if you look at the tail of the worker, this is another distinguishing characteristic between the males and the females. Females have got quite pointed tails, whereas the males have got more rounded tails. And 
here's a male again with the same characteristics in colour and you can see his longer more curving antennae here. The garden bumblebee again said to be very common but don't see very many here and if you look at the patterns on the garden bumblebee you've got three yellow stripes one across the front of the thorax one at the back of the thorax and one at the top of the abdomen and then the yellow tail and again a large queen one of the largest queens the worker has exactly the same patterns once again you can see a pointed tail here and these tend to feed particularly on quite deep flowers, flowers with a deep corolla tube. So the availability of flowers can have an effect on where you're likely to be seeing these foraging. And here's the male with the same pattern as the females. Now I'm sorry, this is a very poor quality photograph. I'll come back to this and tell you why it's taking a photograph in such unpromising situation. So here's the garden bumblebee, very big queens and the same pattern on the workers and on the males. So those cover what is described as the big seven, the seven most widespread and common bumblebees in the UK. But depending on where you live, you might see some others, including if you're near some, some heathlands, the heath bumblebee. And we've got some of these on the heathlands up here on the Great Orm. Now this has got the same patterning as the garden bumblebee, but the queens are quite a bit smaller. So again, you can see the one, two, three yellow stripes and the white tail. This is one of the workers, and I wasn't really being cruel to her. No bumblebees were hurt in preparation of this presentation. But one of the distinguishing characteristics, compare these with the garden bumblebees we've just been looking at, is the shape of the face. So I needed to get a good look at her. So I was holding her very gently in this little box here. But some of these little tiny worker bees can actually escape from these pots. They can squeeze their way through the holes and fly off. So they're not quite as big as they look under all that fur. And here's the male. Again, he's got the three yellow stripes. He's got more yellow on his head. He's got, again, got a yellow face. Now to tell the difference between the heath bumblebees and the garden bumblebees, which have got the same stripes, the most telling characteristic is the shape of the face. So here on the garden bumblebee, they've got a very long face and they're sometimes described as being horse face. The garden bumblebee's got the longest tongue on star UK bumblebee. And you sometimes see them flying from flower to flower with the tongue still hanging out. And so it's got a long face, a long head to be able to accommodate this tongue. Now the head on the heath bumblebee is much rounder. So that was why I had the worker squashed in the pot so that I could look at the shape of her face. This is the male here. And so he's got yellow on his face as well. So that's an additional characteristic to tell the difference between him and the males of the garden bumblebees, which don't have this yellow hair on the faces. So this is one that you might see if you live somewhere close to the heathland. Another one that you might see if you live in one of the upland areas is the bilberry or mountain bumblebee, Bombus monticola. Now I'm sorry this isn't a very good photo of the queen here. The gentleman to whom I sent this for verification said could I not have got a better photo? I'm afraid the answer was no, I just managed to snap this. And then she buzzed off, never to be seen again. But these have got um, black with some yellow stripes on the front, see them working in. And a very large area, bright orange red hair on the abdomen. So at least half of the abdomen is covered with yellow hair compared with a red tail, so with red hair compared to the red tail bumblebee where only the end of the tail is red. So this is the work which you can see the pattern on much better. So here you've got the red extending up halfway up the abdomen and two yellow bands. Now this can make them look 
quite similar to a male red-tailed bumblebee. If you've got pollen, then it's obviously a female because males don't collect pollen. So with pollen, I can see easily this is um, a bilby bumblebee. But I do get excited sometimes when I see the male red-tailed bumblebees coming out. And I've got pollen around to see how much red they've got on them. So I say we've got a few of these bumblebees up on the heathlands on the Great Orm, but not a great many. So I say if you live in one of the upland areas, you might find that you're seeing more of these bilby bumblebees. This is just to give an indication of the relative sizes of the bumblebees. So you can see the garden, buff tailed, white tailed, and red tailed bumblebees have all got very large queens. The common carda is a little bit smaller, and the tree bumblebee would be a similar size to the common carda. And then the early bumblebee is the smallest of these. And so their workers will range in size in a similar way as well. So just to summarise the differences between the males and the females, the characteristics, so you can look out for if there aren't any colour patterns that differ between the males and the females, which make them easy to spot. So first of all, looking at the legs, if there's a pollen basket, easy to see that that's a female. If the bee's not covering, carrying pollen, and it's got this shiny section on the leg here with the long hair fringing it, then this is a female, whereas the males have got hairy legs. So the first thing is that male bumblebees have got hairy legs. Next thing you might be able to see is the tail. I mentioned the females have got the pointed tip to the tail, whereas males have got a much more rounded tip to the tail. The antennae, another distinguishing characteristic with the males, and these longer, slightly curved antennae compared with the shorter, straighter ones on the females. And then for some of the species, the males have got yellow faces. All the common species, apart from the bilberry bumblebee, the females have got black faces or brown in the case of the common carder. So if it's one of those species and it's got the yellow face, then you know it's a male. So the early red tailed, white tailed, and heath bumblebees, all those males have yellow faces. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about some of the different bumblebees that you might see in your garden. As I say, you might have rare ones as well. So I'll give you at the end some links for more information to help you to identify other bumblebees. So we're going to talk now a bit about the life of bumblebees. So we'll go through the bumblebee life cycle, starting off with the queens coming out of hibernation in the spring. Only the queens survive over winter. So each queen is a potential new colony. So when she first comes out, it's important that she uh, feeds after hibernation. So having Nectar around is very important, and she's also got to start gathering pollen and looking for a nest. If you see these bumblebees crawling about on the ground, they're investigating places where they might be able to nest. And you see them flying about low over the ground and quartering the ground, they're often looking for somewhere to nest. So most of the bumblebee species nest on or underground. So the queen will spend quite a bit of time looking for a suitable nest site. And in preference, she'll choose somewhere on the south, southeast facing slope, somewhere to be relatively warm. Once she's found her nest site, she then has to start stocking it. So she'll be gathering pollen to make a um, little stock here, and she makes herself a little nectar pot out of wax and she puts a supply of nectar in the pot because once she's set up the, the nest, the um, pile of pollen, the nectar pot, she'll then lay the eggs <coughs> excuse me, and start brooding them. And so she'll sit on them like a hen on her eggs and keep them warm. 
And one reason she's able to do this is that she can raise her body temperature. So bees are sometimes described as being warm blooded. If you look at the temperature graph here, you can see a lot of the bee is sort of an, an orange yellowy color here. This is showing this temperature can get up to 30 degrees or more. And one of the ways they're able to raise the temperature is that they can effectively unhitch the, the wings and then shiver the flight muscles without the wings moving. And that raises the body temperature. And then because of all the hair they've got on, they're able to retain the heat quite well. So the bumblebees can raise their temperature. This does take a lot of energy, so it's important that she has her supply of nectar available while she's sitting on her nest to raise her first brood. Once she's raised the first brood, the first workers, then these workers, sorry, there's some um, developing bumblebee larvae here. So the workers can start going out and foraging and helping to raise the next brood of workers. So to start with, the queen has to do everything by herself, but then to raise more workers, you can then um, help in the work. And with the different species, there may be from 50 to 500 worker bumblebees within the nest. So that's still quite a low number compared with the thousands of bees that there are within the beehive. I'll just show you some examples of nests. These are some bucktail bumblebees leaving their nest entrance. A lot of the bumblebees will nest underground, for instance, in old mouse burrows and things like that. They can't go make big holes for themselves. So when the queen's nest hunting, she'll be looking for somewhere where there's a ready-made hole where she can start to build her nest. So the workers here have been coming in and out of the hole. And I watched this one for quite a while. And there were some worker bees sitting around the hole, chewing off the grass stems or roots and gradually clearing the entrance to the nest. They need somewhere where the ground's undisturbed to set up their nest. And we get quite a few bumblebee nests in our churchyard at St Tidmo's, and this in fact was one of our nests up at St Tidmo's. So a lot of the bumblebee species will nest like this in a hole underground, and it can be really quite hard to spot them unless you see bumblebees suddenly flying in and out of the grass, but there seems to be no reason for them to be there if there aren't any flowers about. So do look out for bumblebees suddenly appearing out of undisturbed grassy areas, and you might be able to find that there's a nest there. The common part of bumblebees nest above the ground in dried leaves or um, clumps of grass, and you see here they've got the nest here over the surface of the ground, here amongst the dry leaves. This is the only one I've seen, and it's in my colleague's neighbour's garden in Northamptonshire. My colleague's neighbour very kindly let me go around to photograph the nest. And it almost looked as if it were breathing. You could see the surface rising and falling slightly as all the bumblebees were busy inside the nest. So that's the common harder nesting on the surface. Now the tree bumblebee, as its name suggests, nests preferably, preferentially in trees, but they can make use of nest spaces in a lot of other above ground areas. Things like bird boxes, quite popular, you might find them nesting in lofts as well. But these were nesting in a tree one of my other photos from outside this area, we have found um, tree bumblebees nesting on the Great Orm as well. And you can see there's a lot of bumblebees hanging about here. And this is a cloud of males, it's sometimes called a drone cloud, hanging around waiting for the new queens to emerge. So the worker bumblebees were going straight in and out of the nest here, but the males were hanging about, buzzing about, is waiting to meet the new queens and might sometimes look intimidating if you've got a bumblebee nest say in the bird box at home but male bumblebees can't sting they've got no sting at all so all these males buzzing around outside the nest can't do you any harm most bumblebees are pretty placid 
But if the tree bumblebees have their nests disturbed, then there is more of a risk of those stinging than the other bumblebees. So for instance, if they're nesting in a nest box, which is on perhaps a shed that's not very firm and it gets vibrated, then that can upset the bees. But otherwise, they're generally quite placid and we can usually get along quite happily with bumblebees nesting close to homes. So back to the life cycle. Generally in the spring and summer, the new queens and the males will be produced. But the early bumblebee, the early nesting bumblebee, up here on the Great Orm, the males have been about since May time. But it might be June or July before the males and the new queens are produced in some of the other species. Now, the males, as I mentioned, don't gather pollen. They don't do anything to contribute to the nest. And they may spend a lot of their time sitting around on comfy looking flowers like the knapweed here or thistle type flowers drinking nectar. So they don't have very much to do apart from waiting around to get to know the new queens. So they'll sit around drinking and then watch out for the new queens. Some of the species have particular behaviours to try and attack, attract the queens. Some will do what's called hilltopping and a lot of the males will gather at the top of a hill and I'm not sure how successful they are in attracting the queens there. Others will have circuits that they'll go round and mark. This is actually a cuckoo, male cuckoo bumblebee. You can see his curved antennae here. And he was scent marking. He was rubbing this grass head with scent. And so you sometimes see these male bumblebees hanging about, again on plants and plants flowers, and they'll probably be rubbing their scent on there. And you might get a number of bumblebees of the same species following the same circuits, all scent marking in the same areas. And again, I'm not sure how successful they are in attracting the queens, but Charles Darwin got his family involved in doing quite a bit of work following male bumblebees on circuits around his garden and down house. And he'd have children stationed at different points. And the, and the male bumblebees came around marking they'd be pointing out Here's a bumblebee, here's a bumblebee. So that's some behaviour you might see from male bumblebees. The other thing about the males is, is they don't contribute to the nest. Once they leave the nest, they don't go back to it. So the new queens, when they develop, as they're feeding themselves up, they can still keep returning to the nest. So they've got shelter there, but the males have to make do with whatever they can find overnight. So this was the garden bumblebee that I showed you earlier. And it was just getting dark when I spotted him. And he was sitting here underneath the flowers on the drop board, getting tucked in for the night. Here's a red-tailed male on knapweed doing the same sort of thing, almost looking as if he's using the flower here as an umbrella. Bell-shaped flowers can be very useful for various bees to hide in. And here on the foxglove, you see there's a bee just inside here. Something like, sorry, this is a cat joining me. Um, something like um, evening primrose, which has got big bell-shaped flowers, can also be very good for bees to shelter in. in cold wet conditions with somewhere for the male bumblebees to go at night and you can sometimes see benighted worker bumblebees which haven't got home in time sitting on flowers overnight waiting for the sun to warm them up in the morning. So back to the life cycle. This is a picture, not one of my from the bumblebee conservation trust, showing a mating pair of red-tailed bumblebees. So this is the queen and here we've got the male. You can see the big difference in size between them. It's quite rare to be able to catch quite a pair mating, but here you can see the male and the female bumblebees. So the female bumblebee, after they've mated, will store the sperm until she needs it, right round to the next summer, ready to produce the next generation of male bumblebees. As the 
summer comes to an end and autumn progresses, the numbers of workers in the nest will gradually decline as the flowers that have been feeding on decline and all the bees except the new queens will die off before winter. The new queens find, find themselves somewhere to hibernate, usually below ground and on a north facing slope, somewhere where they're less likely to get woken up by unseasonably warm weather at the end of winter. So here there was a queen bumblebee hibernating in a little hole in a pot, um, flower pot here. So as I said, only the new queen survived over winter. Now not all of them will survive, parasitism will reduce the numbers quite a bit. But each new queen that hatches, comes out of hibernation in the spring, is potentially a new colony. So that's a quick look at the bumblebee life cycle. And I've mentioned cuckoo bumblebees. The ones I've just been talking about with the workers are really described as social bumblebees. And the cuckoo bumblebees do what the name suggests. These don't have queens, they just have males and females. And these tend to be rather sort of meaty looking bumblebees. They're, they look heavy set compared to some of the others. Their wings are often cloudy or smoky, dark smoky colour. They don't have pollen baskets, they don't have to carry their own pollen. They tend to have carrier legs. And you'll often see the exoskeleton showing through. The queens in particular need to be very strong and tough because she will go into the nest of a social bumblebee, kill the existing queen and lay her eggs there. So the workers in the social bumblebee nest will then raise the young of the cuckoo bumblebees. Now it might seem that it might seem that cookie bumblebees are quite a bad thing, but they usually assign there's a healthy population of social bumblebees. There needs to be enough social bumblebees to support the cookie bumblebees. And the different species of cookie bumblebees will tend to parasitize the nest of particular species of social bumblebees and to evolve to look rather like them. So the southern cuckoo bee here, Bombus vestalis, the stars will tend to parasitize the nest of rock tailed bumblebees, and the red tailed cuckoo bee will tend to parasitize the nest of the red tailed bumblebees. So we've got a few of these on the great thorn, particularly the Bombus vestalis. We can see quite a lot of these, but there are six species of cuckoo bumblebees, and you might find that you see various of these bumblebees. Two, habitat for bumblebees. Wildflower meadows are an ideal habitat for bumblebees. I had a look on the internet for a traditional wildflower meadow. I couldn't find quite what I wanted, but this gives the general impression. So with a lot of flowers, a wide range of flowers. And the biggest problem that bumblebees have been facing is that since the Second World War, 95% of these wildflower meadows have been lost. So the main problem they've been facing is loss of habitat. And this is where gardeners can start to give a lot of help to the bumblebees. If you think of the area of the country, of the country which is covered by gardens, if everyone put in a few plants for bumblebees, that would start to make a huge difference. So choosing suitable plants for bumblebees in your garden can give a huge benefit to the bumblebees. And here on the Great Orm, there's many time periods in the year when there are relatively few flowers on the Great Orm that the bumblebees like. But we'll see a lot more of the bumblebees in the gardens on the Great Orm, the public gardens, and also in private gardens. So gardening for bumblebees can be really beneficial. Now, not all flowers are suitable. A lot of these popular bedding plants, while they look very bright and colourful, they offer little or no pollen for bumblebees. Another problem can be these very fancy flowers with a lot of double flowers 
and it's very difficult for the bumblebees here to find any nectar or pollen which they might have. So flowers which are good for bumblebees are things like traditional cottage garden plants, like the true geranium here rather than the pelargonium, nice open flower, an open dahlia with the bumblebees, sabius here, lavender used by a lot of bees, very popular bee plant, and the red clover particularly used by the long tongued bumblebees. Legumes are really important for bumblebees because the high protein pollen which they produce is very important for the development of the bumblebee larvae. So the hay meadows that have been lost, a lot of them would have contained red clover and white clover as part of the species mix. And I've just been reading a book about farming in the 1920s where they talk about hay crops of just red clover or just and not that they do, which would have provided huge areas of legume pollen for the bumblebees. So whatever we can do to produce plants that are good for bumblebees can start to make a big difference. Now I'll be mentioning the length of the bumblebee's tongue and tongue length in bees as a whole varies quite a lot. So the scale here gives the length of the tongue in millimetres. So most solitary bees have got quite short tongues, here up to about seven millimetres. Honeybee workers have got quite a small range of tongue length. And bumblebee workers, their tongues can range from about five up to 13 millimetres. For the solitary bees like the flower bees, heavy-footed flower bees I mentioned earlier, quite big bees, those have got quite long tongues as well. And the bumblebee queens have got very long Times here, with the longest being that of the garden bumblebee. So the garden bumblebees have got very long tongues, which means that they feed on deep flowers, flowers with deep corolla tubes. The common harder bumblebee has got medium length tongue, again like the garden bumblebee, you can see her tongue sticking out here while she's flying. So they can feed on both short um, open flowers and on some quite deep flowers. But most of the other common bumblebees have got short tongues and so they're unable to feed on some of the deep flowers. So when planning gardening for a bumblebee, to be able to support a good range of bumblebees, it's important to have a range of different types of flowers. So the longer the tongue of the bumblebee, the deeper the flower that can be used. So here we've got the short-tailed bumblebee, soft-tailed bumblebee, and the dandelion. Now dandelions are brilliant. Every garden should have a clump of dandelions. I have a slogan, deadhead your dandelions. That will keep them flowering. Hence you've got a very long flowering period, and they're used by bumblebees, solitary bees, and quite a few other insects. So look after your dandelions, and you can look after the bees as well. Here on the red clover, you've got um, common carder, bumblebee, and on the box glove here, the small flowered box glove, the very long tailed garden bumblebee. So, if we haven't got flowers with a deep corolla tube, we're likely to see far fewer of the garden bumblebees. So, that's one way you can make a difference in your garden by having a range of different types of flowers. The, the buff tailed bumblebees can actually be a bit naughty, and because she can't get her tongue down a long corolla tube like here on the Cosiana. And she's biting a hole here at the base so that she can get the nectar. So the plant's not going to get any benefit from pollination from the nectar. And once one bumblebee has made a hole here, other bees will come along and use this hole as well. It does seem to be just the buff-tailed bumblebees that have evolved this nectar robbing habit. Now, if you watch bumblebees, you'll see that they can fly around the flowers, but they don't necessarily land on all of the flowers on the plant. Here we've got a, an early male, male early bumblebee flying around my hebe. And he didn't land on all of these flowers. And this is because bumblebees have got smelly feet. And this doesn't mean that they don't like smelling another bumblebee's feet, but the scent from the bumblebee's feet left on the flowers can tell the next bumblebee who comes along how long it is 
since the previous bumblebee was there. And they can very quickly learn the different types of flower, how long it takes the nectaries to refill. So they can smell where the other bumblebees have been and decide if it's going to be worth visiting that flower for the nectar or whether to move along to the next one. I've put together a chart here from this book, Plants for Bees, to give an indication of plants that are good for bees and times when they're flowering. And if anybody's interested in this, I can send copies to Mark. But if you just look at the patterns here for honeybees, short honey bumblebees, long tailed bumblebees, and solitary bees, got a traffic light system, white they're not used, red they're not very good, orange they're not bad, and green they're very good. So if we look at the dandelions here, brilliant dandelions used by all the different sorts of bumblebees. The next section here gives the average flowering time for each of these. So again, looking at the dandelion, look at this, we have really long flowering periods. Here I've taken it from February up to October. The sort of range of time when the bees are likely to be needing flowers from when the queens first start to emerge to when the new queens go back into hibernation. Then here I've indicated for allotment holders, whether these are crops that could produce useful flowers, if they're native wildflowers, ornamentals, something in the hedges, and then from the butterfly conservation work, whether this plant comes on the list of 100 best butterfly plants. But if you look at the pattern here, you can see there's usually plenty of flowers available through the middle part of the summer. So the challenge is getting plants that will flower in the early part of the season or at the end of the season. And there's a second page coming through the rest of the alphabet as well. So, as I said, there's usually plenty of flowers, plenty of flowers in the summer, quite a good choice, but it's in the spring and the autumn that availability of flowers is most important. So just to sum up what we need for flowers, we super flowers from March or February through to October, with the beginning of the end of the season being a time when we can make a big difference in helping the bumblebees. So we need flowers that provide pollen and nectar, not the double flowers, it's very difficult for the bumblebees to get to. So many cottage garden plants are very good, but many popular bedding plants are not suitable. And the other thing that's important is the plant being patches and not dotted about. It is much more energy efficient for the bumblebees to move in a small area from flower to flower, rather than having to dot about through your garden to find suitable flowers. Weeds are flowers too. Weeds can be very important wildflowers. We've been talking about um, gardening for wildlife. I'm sure you've been talking about which wildflowers are good for bees. And remember my favourites, the dandelions. They've hid your dandelions. Then you can also find useful plants in the hedges, grass paths and lawns. Dave Gulson, who set up the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, has his own um, thing that the teeth is charting in comparison to my dead head or dandelions, and that is leave your grass longer, cut less often, is his suggestion. Because in lawns, there's often um, plants like clovers, which can be very good for the, dan for the bumblebees, as well as your lovely dandelions. So don't cut your grass too often, and you may find you've got a lot of beautiful and bee friendly plants in your lawn. So just to run quickly through some of the resources which are available, and I've sent Mark an email with all the links I'll be showing you. If there's anything you're interested in, you can then have a look at the links. So first of all, you don't need any fancy equipment really to look at bumblebees. I have got a net, but most bumblebees can be caught quite easily in the pot. This is the, the queen bee market cage that's used by beekeepers in which you saw me with the little heath bumblebee caught. So this is a handy way of gently immobilising the bee so you can look at its characteristics. These little bug pots are very handy, they're quite a nice size, easy to catch the bees in. And this one's got a small 
magnifier on the lid. This is quite a nice size for children to look at bumblebees in. You can see them quite clearly here. But you don't even need to get a bug pot. A small jam jar will do. And you can always use a bit of kitchen paper or cotton wool to squash your bee into a smaller area to get a closer look at it. Just a word on handling bees. If you see a bee while you're looking at it, sticking out its leg, often middle leg like this, that's a sign that it's not terribly happy. Now, I've said the male bumblebees can't sting, but if you see a bumblebee sticking out its leg, waving its leg at you, best to back off and leave it in peace. But otherwise, they're generally pretty placid. And if you've had them in one of these pots, when you um, let them out, just let them fly away from you and you should be quite safe. So this is a brilliant book produced by the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. It gives very good details on identifying all the different bumblebee species and it will show the main characteristics to look on each bumblebee, tell you which other bumblebee species are similar and look at the characteristics that show the differences between them. There's also a bit of information on gardening for bumblebees and the life of bumblebees. So it's available through all good book stores, as they say. There's a couple of links here, one through the Bumblebee Conservation Trust website and one through the Natural History Book Society. This is the book I was using for making up my chart on plants for bees. And it's actually quite expensive. I did have, it's gone up since I bought my copy. I did have a look online to see whether there are any second hand copies available through a popular online supplier of books. And I couldn't see any at the moment, but it might be worth, if you're interested in this, keeping an eye out for any second hand copies that might be around. The Conservation Trust also produces a range of cards for identification of common bumblebees, the cuckoo bumblebees or the less common bumblebees and there's an online step-by-step -step guide and there's a video where one of the experts can talk you through identifying bumblebees. Also on the Conservation Trust website there's a page where you can see pictures of all the different UK bumblebees. There's an example here of the tree bumblebee which shows the queen worker and male and their patterns and also distribution map so you can see where the tree bumblebee has got to so far. If you want just a very simple basic reminder of the most common bumblebee species, this is actually from one of the children's pages, but it does give a quick guide to the common bumblebees, with the exception of the tree bumblebee that's not on there at the moment. There's various activities for children, the main page here. This is my favourite, the bumblebee mobile. I've had to repair mine because I've taken it to quite a few talks and demonstrations. It has been updated with a different style of bumblebee, but you can make them in good new creative fashion by mounting bees on an old cereal packet. And it's quite nice for children to make these bumblebees. And also got different patterns for the different bumblebees. So you can start to learn about bumblebees as well. There's information on the Trust website about gardening for bumblebees and there's this very handy bee kind tool in which you can click on plants that you've got in your garden or plants that you like it will tell you about the plants and the plants have been rated for how good they are for bumblebees and you'll get the score at the end and information on how you can improve your score to show that you've improved your habitat for bumblebees. And if you're interested in bumblebees, it'd be wonderful to like to join the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. It's a really nice, friendly organisation and lots for people to do, lots to get involved in, lots of information. And so there'll be information here on joining the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. So I hope that's given you an introduction to bumblebees, some of the things to look for when you're trying to identify a bumblebee and some ideas for improving your garden to help the bumblebees. So we'll go on to questions now. And if there are any questions that I can't answer, then I'll make a note of them, pass them on to the experts at the Conservation Trust, and 
pass the answers back to Mark 